Okay, so hello everyone. This is our uh, podcast uh, number three, and today we are with uh, William Spencer. Hello, William. How are you doing today? Hi, Roman. I'm doing good. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to have you. <laughs> so, William, can you tell us a little bit more about you before we get started? Yeah, I'm originally from England. I live now in New Jersey, uh, having married an, an American girl from uh, Manhattan. And I'm semi-retired. I spent most of my life doing organizational change and corporate training work. And um, I still love to be on my bicycle. I get out on my bicycle as much as I can. And I have two kids. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> so what led you to start long distance cycling? Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, really, Roman, because initially... Why I started to cycle is I grew up in a, a kind of a crazy household. My mom and dad were both alcoholic. They were kind of at war with one another. So our house was always a bit of a, a war zone, a crazy place. And when I was younger, I when I was very young, I used to just leave the house for the day. But as I got a little bit older and I was given a bicycle one Christmas, I found that I could go away on my bicycle And there's something about the bicycle when you're there, you're moving your feet like this, you've got the wind in your face, you're in, in nature. And I found that that made me very calm and settled and was it really kind of, if you could say, like the medicine to the problem that I had at home. Yeah. So that, that was really the first thing. And then, and then the other thing was the town I grew up in, which was north of London, a town called Hemel Hempstead. We were near beautiful English countryside. And... The other reason I started cycling is I just so loved going out among the trees, uh, seeing nature, these beautiful vistas, you know, summer, summer's day with the butterflies and the bees. And, oh, I just, it was, it was getting away from home and it was also being out in the beauty of nature. Was it easy to get out from home? Are you, were you living near the city, a big city? Or was there a lot of parks around and... Yeah, yeah. Well, no, great, great question. Well, you know, we're talking, I'm now 67. So we're talking about a time when there was a lot less cars true, on the road. I've, I've actually, I've gone back to England and I tried to cycle the same places I used to cycle as a boy, you know, down these small country roads with hedges either side. And it's dangerous now. When I was a boy, it wasn't. So we lived in a, you know, a town of 100,000 people and the countryside was right there. So I could very easily get out into small country lanes, spend the day and never really have to deal with traffic. And actually to this day, I still always look for places I can cycle, which doesn't have a lot of traffic because I, I don't like dry, cycling with cars. Yeah, I'm the same. Living in yeah. Kuala Lumpur, it's not easy for cycling. <laughs> not easy at all. <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah, no, you will die. Cars and trucks don't care, don't care about you here. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. And I imagine also the air pollution too. Not good to be breathing that. Yeah, cycling with the the yeah, the smoke in your face and everything. The the regulation in Malaysia, I think, is, is pretty bad on the for the cars and trucks. Right, right. And you have the tuk tuk tuks and everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of um where where did you go? What uh, what country did you visit and um Yeah, but country yeah, so, on the bicycle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've done a number, quite a few long, long trips. My first long one was I was a young guy in the UK and uh, me and a girlfriend spent three, four months. And we did a huge circle all around, around Europe. And we started in England, all through France, across the, uh, through the Riviera, into Italy, you know, okay. Torino. Sorry, and, what, year? what year was that? Uh, that was... Now you're asking. Uh, yeah. That was, I think, 1976. 76. Yeah. All right. 76. Just yeah. to let everyone know that it's different at that time that it was at this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, and, and, you know, I talked about in England how there was less cars. Of course, in everywhere in Europe, there was less cars. Um, and we cycled across the Alps uh, in winter. It was frozen. It was so cold going down these paths through the Alps. We just had regular brakes, you know, not disc brakes. Uh, and it would all, it just full of ice and you wouldn't stop the, the bike. So it, what's that? What about the tires? Because now they, 
the spike tires for the for the snow, but right. at the time maybe did not exist. You know? No, no, no. We, you, I used to study the road very carefully and try and make sure I stayed on the dry patches. But what 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 we did is the snow plows had come through and they left big snow at every turn of the road. So we just ride our bikes down and woof, go into the snow to stop and then get on again and then woof, go into the snow again to stop. Uh, so that that was, uh, and then we went back into France, into Belgium. Uh, and then got back really in the middle, middle of, of winter. And it was on the last day of that trip when we stayed at the Dover Youth Hostel. There was a book in the library there that gave me an idea for my next trip. So this book was an overland to India guidebook. It was kind of a hippie guidebook. Yeah. And I, I was, you know, we just stayed one night and I picked up this book and I was reading. And in the introduction, I still remember it said, the writer said, a year spent in India is worth 10 years of formal education in the West. Wow. And when I read that, when I read that, I thought, wow, yeah, yeah, wow, India. And I'd always been, since I was a young boy, I've always been fascinated by India. So actually six months later then, um, I then went left to India on the bicycle. So that was my second journey, was from England to India, where I went England, France, Italy, what was then Yugoslavia, into Greece, to, to a Greek island, uh, Samos, then to the Turkish mainland, all along the Mediterranean coast of Turkey. It was getting very, very cold. So then to avoid the cold, we went south through Syria into Jordan, stayed for a, a winter time in a kibbutz in Israel, then left again into Jordan, back through Syria, into eastern Turkey, across Iran, across the Elbers Mountains, along the Caspian Sea, uh, into Afghanistan. Um, and I was in Afghanistan. I was in Kandahar on the night of a coup that overthrew a stable government, what had been a stable government for 100 years, uh, then into Pakistan. Uh, and I had no, I had very little information. I, this was obviously before cell phones. Of course. I had one, I had one map one big map and actually somebody, I, I lent the map to somebody where, when I was in Tehran and they never gave it back to me. So I didn't really have a map, but I had a general idea. Um, and, you know, in Pakistan, I found out that the only border crossing to India was a, about a thousand kilometers to the north. So I'd gone all the way to the south thinking I could cross into India down there. But then I found, oh no, you know, since partition of India and Pakistan, there's only one border crossing. So I had to cycle all the way up the Indus River Valley and then into India. Well, what, what about the, the visa? Because now we know that at that time now, it's very complicated to get visa to, to pass through different countries. But in the yes. 70s, how, how it was? Was it easier? Uh, I think in some ways it was easier, but there were some countries I wanted to go through which I couldn't. So, for example, when I was in Israel and I was studying the map of how I was going to continue to, to India, I saw that the, the easiest way would be to go back into Jordan, then cross through Iraq, and then go across, you know, the water to, to Iran. Uh, but you, they, there was no way you could be given a visa for Iraq. You had to be a, a business person on a business visa. Even at that uh, time, Iraq was closed. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I really wanted, and there was some, a, a couple of other places where I really wanted to go and I couldn't get, couldn't get visas. But the places I went, it was easy. I mean, in Europe, I didn't need visas, um, but Turkey, the, you know, these, these were places where you got the visa when you arrived. So you arrived at the, at the border, you applied, you know, you got a visa, you didn't need to get it ahead of time. The, the one thing that was quite complicated was, and we, I'd met other travelers who told me about this, that to cross from uh, Jordan into Israel and then back into Jordan, was a particular problem because if any Arab countries saw an Israeli stamp in your passport, they wouldn't let you back in. Oh, really? And the Israeli authorities knew this. So what they did is when, when they gave you a visa for Israel, they put it on a separate piece of paper. They didn't stamp it in your passport. But what happened for me is that when I got back into you know, Jordan, people saw, well, I've been here for three months. What was I doing? You know, why, why was I in Jordan for three months? And I couldn't say, you know, and I got rid of all of evidence that I've been in Israel. I had an address book with, you know, names of people that I'd met. And I took a black marker and I crossed out anything that said Israel, you know, in case I was searched. Um, 
but yeah, so that that was a complication of going into Israel and then back into into Jordan. And what what about Afghanistan? Because now it's quite dangerous to be in Afghanistan. What what was it like in the in the seventies? Yeah, I mean there were there were places that I passed through. I mean, one of the great things, and you know this, Roman, from the bike, your bike trips that you've done, but when you're there on a bicycle, people are very good to you and people want to look after you. And so people would give me advice about where the dangerous places were. And for example, when I was in Pakistan, you know, people said, oh no, don't, don't go on the West Bank of the Indus River because that's tribal territories. And it's so dangerous there that the police lock themselves in their police stations at night. And the, the whole area is overrun by gun runners and bandits and you, must, you mustn't go there. And long story, I ended up going there anyway. But uh, so people would, would, would tell you kind of the, the dangerous things. But Afghanistan, it was... It was absolutely the most strange and exotic place I had ever been. I mean, for a young man from England to come to this culture that was still, I mean, it felt like it was still in the Middle Ages. You know, there were, there were very few cars, there were only a few trucks. Um, but, you know, getting the visa for there was not, was not that hard. There was a complication that I tell in the story of my book. I wrote a book about that, that trip. And I tell the story, there's a, a complicated story about the visa for Afghanistan that I later found out it was difficult because somebody in Afghanistan knew that there was going to be a coup. So they weren't giving visas beyond a certain date because they didn't want any foreigners there to get caught up in the yeah, yeah. coup. Yeah. How did you apply for the visa at that time? You had to go to the embassy? You had to... Yes. Yeah. So time, yeah. to... to, to uh, to get the Afghan visa, I applied initially in Tehran, in Iran. So in each in each country, I'd know that I needed to, to go to a big city to apply for the visa for the next country. Yeah. So, for example, for Syria, I think I applied for the visa maybe in Antakya or Antalya or Mersin, one of the big uh, Turkish cities. And then when I was in in Syria, in Damascus, I applied for my visa, went to go into uh, Jordan. In Jordan, uh, I got my permit to what they call visit the West Bank of Jordan, which is really Israel. And I did that in Amman. So, yeah, in each country, I knew the next country and I'd go to the big city and apply to the embassy there. Yeah. yeah and I think you did not mention how old were you when you did this trip? Yeah, I was a very naive <laughs> 22, 22 years old. 22. Yeah. What, what did your parents think about this or your family or your friends? What did they think about this? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I told you earlier that um, my parents were always at war with yes. one another. So right. by the time that they had divorced later, so it was actually, I was living with my mom and my stepfather and my mom was French and she traveled all over the world, lived in Australia. She, so she was a real, real traveler. She really supported me. And she, <laughs> I talk about this in my book, but she really wanted to show my encouragement. So just before I left one day, she comes back home and she says, I've got a gift for you. And she gives me a little hand trowel, you know, that you use in the garden to make plants. And I said, well, what, what's this for? She said, oh, this is so that you can bury your poo when you, when you travel. <laughs> But I, I didn't take it with me because the, you know, the, the amount of space you have in your panniers is limited. It's yeah. funny. And do you think that the long distance cycling has changed your life? Would your life would that be different if you had not discovered a long distance cycling? Well, I mean, it would be. I think it would be completely and utterly different. I mean, I probably, I would probably be living in England. I'd probably be depressed. I might well be alcoholic. I probably maybe even have killed myself through drinking, who knows? But most importantly, I probably, because I had this yearning inside me, if I didn't do this journey, I think I would, I would be regretting that I didn't have the courage or I didn't follow the impulse inside and try doing it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, it, my life is certainly, I'm sure about this, really sure that my life greatly improved because of the, the, the long distance, that trip to India, which really changed how I saw myself. It was an odyssey for me. It was like proving myself to myself. Uh, and it also gave me skills and attitudes 
that have helped me be successful. And at the end, you know, in India, I lived in India for some years, and that's where I met my wife, and that's why I'm living in America now. Otherwise, I'd still be living in England. How long, how long did you spend in India? Well, over about seven years in, in, in total. Yeah. Seven years. In which city did you stay? Or did you travel all well, over India? I was, no, no. I was living in an ashram, which is a place where people come to study, study yoga and meditation. Uh, and I actually ended up being the manager there and one thing and another. But uh, that was northeast of Mumbai, of Bombay. Okay. Uh, in the beautiful part of the country, the, the, the foothills to the Deccan Plateau, uh, beautiful place. So you're fluent in Hindi now. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> I wish. I probably, my Hindi might be as good as your Malaysian. All right. Yeah. Check up my well, name. How, how, good is, how good is your? Uh, yeah, just sick, sick. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I've been only <laughs> four years, but yeah. No, I need to learn Malay. You're right. <laughs> uh, so how many countries have you cycled? Do you remember like the total of country you have cycled? Probably 20 thereabouts. 20 countries. You know, I've also, in the past few years, I've done some long distance trips in America. You know, the Erie Canal Way, which is beautiful up in North New York. And there's also maybe the best cycling on the east side of the, the USA is to go from Washington, D.C. to Pittsburgh because there's two bicycle tracks. One is called the CNO Canal, and you're going along this old disused canal. And then that connects with something called the Great Allegheny Passage, GAP, which is an old railway line. And it's absolutely beautiful. So it's about uh, 500 kilometers each way. Um, so I've done that. And then also I've been back to Europe. I've gone around France many times. I've done the Chemin de Compostelle from oh. Toulouse to Compostelle. I, a few years ago, I went from Amsterdam to Budapest along the Rhine and the Danube. So when, whenever I can, and this year I'm planning to go and do a big four month trip around Europe because now I'm semi-retired. And again, I have time and the kids have left home. And yeah. So, yeah. so how many kilometers in total have you cycled? Probably about 100,000. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Like, but you know how, like, when you buy a good Toyota after 100,000 miles, the, you start to have problems with the car? Well, I, that's kind of how I am. With, you know, my knees creak a little bit. I wished I'd taken better care of my knees because yeah. with cycling, you know, yeah. So, and your bum. Yeah. And your bum. <laughs> and my bum. Yes. <laughs> So what, what are your future plans now? Where, where would you like to go next? Well, like I said, you know, this, this, this summer, if things look like they're going to open up, I, I really want to do uh, some of the Eurovelo routes. So maybe, you know, London to um, the Netherlands, to Berlin, uh, down to Prague, Vienna, um, You know, a big, a big circle, a big circle around Europe. Would you go by yourself, or would you be supported by someone? No, I go by. I mean, for me, the bicycle it still has the same effect on me, but being very, very calming, very grounding. Uh, it helps me reconnect. It helps me lose stress, you know, from my, my work. Um, and so, my wife might come and join me for some flat pieces because she doesn't yeah we talk about this earlier yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we have the same one um, <laughs> <laughs> right right exactly so uh but no on my own and l even though with my earlier trips when i was younger i used to do wild camping you know sometimes i'd have I, on the trip to india i lost my tent my tent was stolen and i used to i started sleeping you know in drainage pipes under the road and then stairwells in apartment buildings and i got very good at finding places to stay And I loved the serendipity, the feeling of being looked after, of finding a place each night. So it's different for me now. But what I do now is I don't plan where I'm going to, how far I'm going to go every day. I get on my bike. I cycle as long as I want, about three or four in the afternoon. I get on my phone and I find somewhere to stay by, you know, calling around. Nice. And that, that for me, that's part of the uncertainty and the joy. I love that. You know, it always works out. Sometimes it's a little difficult. Uh, but, you know, with any people are so good to people on a bicycle. It's like you pull into a cafe, you know, on your bicycle and you tell if you tell a few people, oh, I'm looking for somewhere to stay. Where can I stay? You see, it always happens. People talk to one another. Oh, let's help the cyclist. Let's find a place for him. Uh, it's wonderful. Right. 
People yeah. are just so good to people on bicycles. I, I had some people, it happened to me a few times while cycling in New Zealand that they told me, oh, just pitch your tent in my in my garden. And there's yeah. a guy who had a caravan in his garden and said, why don't you sleep in my caravan tonight? And and then we go yeah. dinner together and then, oh, let's go drink beer together. And yeah, some people are very, very nice. They really uh, yeah, caring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think... That, you know, it brings out, that's one of the, the great things about a bit of bicycle. I think it really brings out the best in people. And I've, I've spoken to many people who've done long distance tours. You know, I'm a member of an, quite a few Facebook groups. And you see people have similar stories that, you know, they're treated so well. These unexpected gifts, people given meals, given, as you say, given a place to stay. Um, and it really, in, today, in today's world, when there's so much in the media about the polarization of politics and, you know, terrorism, this thing, that thing, it's really, I find it's really, really good to reconnect to the fact that human beings are basically good hearted creatures. They are basically, and particularly, particularly the poor people and the simple people of the country you know, cities make us more crazy and maybe, you know, cover up some of our good nature. But you find that on a bicycle. I mean, did you find the same? I find the same as well. I didn't have that much trouble. I don't know if you had troubles on the road, but for me, I, I got robbed once because I was not uh, pretty intention of what, what I was doing. But yes. I, ne I never had any any trouble on the road. Never. No. What about you? No. Did you have any, any like big trouble on the road or get robbed or... Uh, well, no, as I said, when I, when I was in Athens, my tent was stolen. Um, I, I knew that that was a risk. So I always, always had the bicycle with me. I never left the bicycle out of my sight. You know, if I would, if okay, like the few times when I paid for a hotel, if I was very sick, it would be a very cheap hotel, but I would ha have my, have my bike in my room. The, the, the worst thing that happened for me was I had a very big accident when I was in Tehran, um, where, I was coming down a big hill. Actually, after going, I went to the Afghan embassy for my Afghan visa. At the, and the embassy is at the top of a hill. Tehran has some, you know, big hills. Uh, and then I was coming down very, very fast. I must have been doing probably close to 80 kilometers per hour Oof. coming down. And I saw up ahead, there was a red traffic light with a line of cars and the light turned green and the cars started to pull away. And because of that, I just kept going really fast down the side of this taxi. And just before I came there, somebody opened, a passenger opened the door. And I went into the edge of the door and I went over the car and I landed in Tehran. They have these concrete ditches by the side of the road, drainage ditches. I landed in that. Um, and I thought my bicycle journey was over. But, and I tell this story in the book, but what happened then was beyond, I mean, you couldn't invent it. You know, this guy turned up who started to tell me in an accident like this, it's always the car that's at fault. Stay here. A doctor appeared, bandaged my fingers. It's amazing. It's amazing that I wasn't hurt. I mean, I didn't wear a helmet. I didn't, you know, I didn't wear a helmet at that time. Nice. Um, and then a policeman came, carried my bicycle with the cat taxi driver to this bike shop that was a mile away and they gave me food and drinks they repaired the bike they put a new wheel they they managed to the front forks which are usually like that had bent back like that and the wheel was this shape like a, <laughs> a, a, a crescent moon so i got, got a new wheel they repaired the forks and within two hours i was back on the bike wow. saying so you didn't have to go to the hospital or you don't have to no no, no. checkup no nothing no there were, I mean, there was a, there were, like I say, there was a doctor. I don't know where he came from. The doctor was there. He bandaged, you know, I'd, I'd cut my hand. He bandaged that. But I was just really, really lucky that Extremely I didn't lucky. Land, There's no land on my head. And I, I remember that I, I think, you know, you, you don't know in these times, but I think I went into a roll and I rolled a bit. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. So you told us earlier, yeah, you wrote a book as well. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about your book and where people can find it as well if they're interested in purchasing your yeah. book? Yeah, the, you know, I, when I was traveling on the way to India, I kept a very detailed diary. 
like every day that was that's what I would do. I would, you know, have an evening snack, whatever, you know, bread, cheese, whatever. And then I would sit uh, with a little bit of light, usually the last light of day, actually, because I didn't really have a, a I had a flashlight sometime, but not most of the time. Uh, then I would write my diary and that I've had a kind of busy work life. I've had, you know, two children and there really wasn't time. I kept on thinking, I want to turn this into a book. I want to turn this into a book because of COVID. I was at home a lot and I was able then to take those diaries and turn them into a book. And I really, there's two reasons. I th- there's really two reasons that I wrote the book. The first is because this, I've told you a few little pieces, but the, the story itself, it seemed almost like the story had a life of its own. And the story was almost saying, tell me, I need to be told. And I, the other reason I wrote the book is because I was so well treated by people in Muslim countries again and again and again. You know, the poor farmer, the student, the railway station, station master, all these people, people who had nothing, treating me like I was a visiting king. It's true. Because of that, I came to understand, oh, Islam actually is this wonderful, generous faith. And that's such a different story from what we get with terrorism and, you know, the, Maybe. and that's also, that is part of Islam also, but the, for the common man, for millions and millions of people, Islam is a force for good. So I wanted to share that with people. And I wanted, and there's a little bit in the book about Islam, which is, as I learned it, I sort of shared it in the book. And so I really wanted, I, I hope that people will read the book and will get inspired by the journey be entertained by the journey because there's a lot happened, but also come away thinking about the goodness of people and maybe have a slightly different view of Islam. We didn't speak about this earlier, but how did you afford this trip? Because you were so <laughs> young. So how did yeah, you yeah. afford this trip at this time? Where did you right. find money? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I was, I was lucky because I'd been, I was working, uh, doing computer work, Uh, at that time, I was doing some computer programming work. And by a divine coincidence, I was given the opportunity to work uh, a four-day weekend over the Easter weekend where nobody else wanted to work. And they paid me four times the usual price because nobody else wanted to do this work. And I was young. I didn't care. So I did it. And just that money is what I lived on for a year. It was It's very little money because by the end of the journey, my budget each day was about five rupees, which in, you know, is US about 15 cents, I think, you know, 10, 10 cent in euro. A day. So very little money. A day. A day. Five, you could live with five rupee a day. Yes. In the end, because wow. <laughs> I was sleeping outside. I had a plastic sheet. By that point, I just slept out under trees. There was no rain. Uh, where there was rain, I used to, you know, find somewhere at least a bit dry. Um, the only expense I had, I didn't didn't have a cell phone, so I didn't have to have any cell phone charges. No, of course. Yeah. Uh, the, the <laughs> only the only expense was food, and part of what I said earlier about the generosity of Muslim people, of people in you know Muslim countries, there was predictably there was always offers of food, of chai, of a place to stay. And it actually, and I say this in the book, that actually what happened was I got so many invitations so regularly that actually I ended up realizing, oh, no, I really don't want to be have company again tonight because I've always got to tell the same stories and I've got to stay up late with them and talk to them. But the point is that I was given so much money, food, care, Um, and so that's how I was able to live on five rupees a day. Yep. And what made you come back to your country? <laughs> uh, why you decide to, well, live, to live in there? Well, well, it was it basically it was health. So, uh, you know, I ended up having quite a history of GI problems. You know, you, there's a lot of uh, issues you can have in the tropics, as you know. Uh, and that's really what uh, I got very, very, I got quite sick and I needed to come back to England. Yeah. Was it dinghy? Was it a dinghy or? Uh, no, it's just, uh, you know, parasite infections, so intestinal parasites. All right. Yeah. All right. So From bad water, bad, bad food, 
bad for the air yeah, in India. <laughs> but, uh, right. Well, but before that, though, and it's, this is in the book, but I, you know, I, in Pakistan, I got very, very sick with hepatitis. Oh. Um, you know, the, the, the whites of my eyes were the color of ripe pumpkin. It was bright orange, the whites of my eyes. And I was, and that was one of the reasons initially why I stayed in India, because I was just too weak to continue. And your health is good now? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the yeah. GI problems have stayed with me and have been a, an old friend, but yes. <laughs> so can you tell us where people can find your book? I will put all the links in the description below. But oh, thank tell you. us where people can find your book. Yeah, well, the, 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 the book, you can get it really anywhere where you buy books, basically. You buy an Amazon, an independent bookshop, uh, you know, online uh, in India, books, B-U-K-S. There's, you really get it anywhere. You get the ebook anywhere. You get the ebook uh, on Amazon. You can get it on Google Play. Uh, and there's also an audio book. So uh, you get the audio book on iTunes. You can also get the audio book on uh, Audible, Amazon Audible. So uh, basically, if you search for it in your country, you search the title, you will see where you can buy it. It's very easy to get. Fast, I hope it's easy to get. Fast, sweeter than honey. Why this title? Ah, okay. <laughs> why? I'm going to uh, read. Why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me read you the little poem that comes from a Persian poet, Saadi, uh, from an a, a epic poem. So Saadi is kind of like uh, the Persian Shakespeare from the same sort of era. And he wrote some beautiful poems. And this is one of the poems that starts my book. Oops, one second. In many lands I have wandered and wondered and listened and seen, and many my friends and companions and teachers and lovers have been. And I said to my soul in secret, O thou who from journeys art come, it is meet that we should bear some token of love to the stayers at home. But if my hands were empty of honey and pearls and gold, there were treasures far sweeter than honey and marvelous things to be told. Beautiful. <laughs> That's very, very beautiful. So just before we uh, finish, do you have anything to say to the people who are listening this? So maybe advice for people who would like to do a, a trip or to start long distance cycling? Yeah, I think my two ideas would be, and this actually, I mentioned that book in Dover, the, the, the Overland to India book. One piece of advice in that, which I think is really good, is pay off all your debts. I mean, emotional debts, financial debts, so that you can really leave and be free. So that's one, one thing. Um, so get your affairs in order, you know, check your health, get your teeth looked after, all of that, because those are things that can cause you trouble when you're, when you're going. The other thing I see when I look at Facebook, they have many people have these photographs of all this stuff that they're going to take with them on their journey. And when I see these pictures, I often think to myself, you know what, you're going to find out that you need less than you think, because wherever there are roads, there are people. Wherever there are people, there are houses, there's food, there's care, there's medical attention of some kind. So you need less than you think. And there's this wonderful idea that when you're packing, you should lay out everything you think you absolutely need and then remove half of it. So I would say take less stuff. And the last thing is you don't need expensive equipment. You don't need an expensive bike. You don't need carbon this, titanium that. You can buy a secondhand steel bicycle. You can buy used pannier bags. I wouldn't go crazy on needing all the equipment. And if you spend $3,000, 3,000 euro on a bike, or you spend 30 euros or $30 on a bike, when you meet that first mountain, there's no difference. You're going to have to pedal your way up it. So <laughs> It doesn't make any difference how fancy your bike is. No, you're going to struggle anyway. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to do the work anyway. Thank you very, very much for today, William. It was very, very nice to meet you. And you. Robert. I wish you, Thank you all for the best, William. Thank you for everyone to listening as well. And yeah. uh, see you on the next podcast, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>